So this evening you're going to see me on a wire and I'm going to try not to pull down my entire audio and computer rig along with Magnus's to the floor. In case I do that, there's going to be a large crash and we're going to continue ad hoc. I didn't think about that. <laughs> <laughs> you have yeah, the, the, the minimize button to the left. Someone needs to change the fire alarm. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm a very orderly person. My wife is not. We complement each other perfectly. I like my pencils in a row. I like my cups in a row. I like my ducks in a row. So this presentation is all going to be about ducks and keeping them in a row. I'm just going to, on the point of order, I'm just going to move this out of the way here. So you won't have to look at that. Feels much better. Um, probably, yeah. So how many of you have looked at an execution plan in SQL Server? Good. I can go home now. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about Bluetooth dongles. I'm going to talk about how to, come on. <laughs> That's so. I used to call this my Hugo, Hugo Cornelis slide, but because Hugo's not here and Erland is, so this is my Erland slide. Um, I'm going to simplify stuff. You can go endlessly deep. There are people, <coughs> Erland, who have written long blog posts. And if you think a blog post is like one page, two pages, you should check out Erland Sommarskog's blog, which essentially is, I mean, every single blog post is like a book and it's, you can't go much deeper than that. So be warned, this is pretty much a level 100 session. So I, I want to whet your appetite into the concept of ordering rows and how that affects your query plans and how you can use that to your advantage to make your queries go much, much faster. So basics, how data is stored in SQL Server. I'm just playing with, let's say we have a table, we call it table ducks. We have a int column, an identity for the purpose of this demonstration, and we put a unique clustered index on that integer column. Yay. Let's populate this table with a duck. So meet Daffy, he is the team lead. Uh, he was born on March 14th and he is number one. So he has ID number one, which means he is at the very beginning of our clustered index. Because when we start adding rows like Donna and Moby and Chuck and Arne and other ducks that I've Googled on the internet, they all add to what's known as a page. A page is a logical storage unit in SQL Server that is eight kilobytes large. It includes a small little header, um, And it will point to, when you finish this page, it will point to where the next page begins. So you can scroll through that. That page will point to the next page after that. But there's more. It also has a pointer to the previous page. So either way you look at a clustered index or a table in SQL Server, you can just follow it from top to bottom using the pages and the way they link to each other. A clustered index is a table in SQL Server. It contains everything in the table, essentially. Um, oh yeah, on the simplification part, I'm talking row store now, so there will be exceptions where different things apply in column stores, but they all actually also share pages. So everything in SQL Server, absolutely everything in SQL Server except for the log is stored in pages. How about memory optimized? Sorry. Oh, file stream. Gotcha. Almost anything in SQL Server is stored in pages. <laughs> so a table can exist as a clustered index, which is ordered. All these things come in order. And if you insert something, it will actually move stuff around in the pages and allocate new pages if necessary, just to keep the order which means if you just select star from this clustered index, you will get them 
mostly asterisk in the order that you stored them. But you can also choose to store data in what's known as a heap. A heap is when you don't have a clustering key in the regular sense. You don't have this one, two, three, four, five. It's just the rows are just added in the order that you insert them into the table or where there's free space more or less and no one cares. <laughs> so imagine the clustered index as a sequentially stored set of data. Number one comes first, number two second, number third, and so on, so on, so on. So you can actually just scan through the entire clustered index from start to finish. Um, again, that's something about the terminology. A clustered index is the actual table, whereas a, I'll get to that later, a table is data everywhere, basically. They're still in pages. The pages are still linked, but it's not ordered. We, we really don't care. There is no unique constraint or anything like that implicit in, in the storage. It's just data everywhere and you can't tell what's what. I think the delay is actually from Zoom. No. There. <laughs> so a non-clustered index is a subset of a clustered index. So the clustered index you will remember is the entire table with all of the columns, all of the data, whereas the non-clustered index is like a lookup index on the side. It contains just the stuff that we index and explicitly include and the clustering key. So the non-clustered index is ordered by the index key. So the clustering the clustered index is ordered by the clustered index ordering key, which is the clustering key. The non-clustered index is ordered by that non-clustered -index, non index's ordering key, index key. As usual, also stored in pages. If I'm repeating myself, I haven't really rehearsed this presentation since I did it like a month ago. Uh, you will notice that in this case, these are our ducks, and we've created an index on their first name. So A comes first, then B, then C, then D. And that means our clustering keys are all over the place. But that's the point. We're ordering by the name. So if you want to select star from ducks order by name, it's a smarter move to use a, a non-clustered index on the name column. If you have any questions, just feel free to interrupt me. It's just Magnus' session afterwards, and you know, so we'll be fine. So to visualize, this is the clustered index that we had before. Notice how we use lots and lots and lots of pages to store it because we need to store every piece of information in the table. You might have like a hundred columns in a super wide table. But if we just index on first name, we will, let's see if this works. Yay! We will sort the non-clustered index on the first name and we'll just include the clustering key so that if we select star from this index and we need one more little piece of information, we can use this clustering key to just look up the same record over here in the clustering index. And we'll get to how that happens and why. So scans and seeks. I can see you're already falling asleep, so I'll hurry through this one. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Oh, so it's. This fox symbolizes an index seek. An index seek is where you look up a specific point in an index. It can be clustered or non-clustered. But the point is, an index seek looks up one record, one start somewhere using the key of the index. So for this example, if we select star from dbo.ducks where id equals five, the fox can follow the index straight to number five. We won't have to look for number five in the index. We'll just go right to number five because we have this fancy B3, B tree. <laughs> we have this fancy B tree, binary tree or whatever uh, structure. So we can find record number five immediately without having to look for it. And that's what it looks like. This is the clustered index seek 
operator. The parenthesis actually means that it's clustered. So if you see this operator without the parenthesis, it's a non-clustered index seek. But the principle is the very same. You go directly to the row you're looking for. Uh, this is a super, super fast operation. A version of the index seek is known as the range scan. Same, same idea, but the here, here the uh, argument could be where ID larger than or equal to five or and uh, less than or equal to 10. So between five and 10. Same thing, we start with number five. We can find number five instantly using the index, right? Then we just go along, we follow along in the index in its order, the way the rows are stored physically, until we reach something that is larger than 10 and we stop. As you may have guessed, this is also much, much faster than going through the entire table, which potentially could contain like a million rows or a hundred million rows or whatever. So index seeks and range scans, same operator. They look like this. But the difference is that the range scan, which is a form of index seek, starts like an index seek, then scans until it's returned all the rows that we need. So the index, index scan, that's the one I've been talking about. The index scan is when you look for a property that isn't in the sorting order of the index. Say you're trying to find everyone whose first name starts with A. We don't know that by the ordering. We can't just take the first three records because we're, we're not ordering the data set by name. We're ordering it by ID. And it might very well be that the first and the last duck is called A something. So we need to scan the entire table. This is fine if your table contains 100 rows. It'll be super fast. Uh, if your table contains a billion rows, this might take a while couple of milliseconds if you have fast disks. This is what the index scan looks like. So it starts at the beginning and it scans all of the way through the index. And in the example here, I'm using the non-clustered index on our name column. So I'm starting with Angus, Arne, Bubba, Chuck, Daffy, and moving through the entire set until I reach the very last row. It's the only way to, to actually scan unless you limit the scan using like a top operator or something like that. These are my fancy PowerPoint animations. Yeah, Daniel can teach you all. <laughs> <laughs> there are PowerPoint professionals. I am not one of them. Sargability. Is it sargability or sargeability? Sarg? I think it's sargability because the arg thing is from argument. So I'm going to say sargability. Sargability is the, the ability for SQL Server to use an index and its order to fulfill a search. Now imagine the follow, following criteria. Where ID between 5 and 10? And this is our, our index, it's sorted on ID. How would you solve this puzzle? How would you do it? This is a question for the audience. You could do a search for five and a search for 10, or you could do a search for five and just keep going until it's more than 10, and then you're done, right? So this is the range scan that we were talking about before. Everyone with me? Cool. Index seek. How about this? Where ID between square root of 25 and square root of 100? I kind of li like math in school, but I think you can follow along. Is this, would you scan the entire table or how would you do this? Yes. Why? Because it's not very good. You can, you can use the function. I like your reasoning, but in this case, SQL Server can actually simplify the question for you. It will actually compute those first because you're not putting the square root on the ID, but on the, the argument. So okay, when, yes, when it, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> it was a trap. Yes, it, was, yes. it was a trap, it was intentional. Yeah. So it evaluates all the criteria first, so we get five and 10, and then we apply our friend the index seek. That was a trap, and now you know. Don't answer my questions unless you want me to. <laughs> yeah. How about this? This is another trap. Where power of ID to the, 
to the where ID to the power of two between 25 and 100 will be scanned. How many agree? Oh, right. I'm going to repeat the questions. Correct. Thank you. I'm going to hide your friend here. No, I'm not going to repeat the answers. <laughs> so in this case, SQL Server is pretty much not smart enough to apply the square root on both sides of between or equal or greater or smaller than. Uh, so what it does is, it checks row number one to the power of two is one. Nope. This is going to take ages with zoom. Click. Two to the power of two is four. Still no. Three to the power of two, still no. This is a lot faster when I do it with my cable attached. But you can see that we're trying every single row because we don't know if this ID to the power of two will be between 25 and 100. This is the uh, PowerPoint animation that Magnus was talking about. <laughs> I'll just start a course doing PowerPoint presentations like a techie. So this is a clustered index scan where our data is sorted, but we can't use the sort ordering because we're using a non-sargable argument. And just this week, I was at a client performance tuning and I saw actually uh, an example where you could apply this very exact uh, thing. They had the correct indexing, they had everything. It's just that they were casting um, the uh, column to another data type and then comparing it to a search argument instead of the other way around. So if you make sure that you cast your arguments correctly, let me go to a sargable example, all the way back. So if you make sure that your arguments are in the correct data type and comparatively and, and the calculations are all done and everything is nice so that you can just do a seek on these arguments, your query may be able to use an index seek instead of scanning the entire table. Battery change. So what does a table scan like, look like? A table scan is like a clustered index scan or an index scan, but on a heap. So could you do a clustered index scan on a heap somehow? No, there is no clustered index. The only unique identifier in a heap is technically what's known as a uniqueifier, which is a hidden special column that you don't ever see. Um, so the table scan in a heap is just like the table or the heap actually, it's all over the place. We have to look all over the heap for the values that we want. And if we find the value that we want, we still have to keep going because it might exist in multiple places because the data is not ordered. We have no way of knowing. The only way to find every matching record in a table scan in a heap is using a table scan, which goes through the entire heap. Don't use heaps, just don't. It's really terrible. A key lookup. Have you seen a key lookup? Yes, do you like key lookups? No one loves key lookups. They're the misunderstood. Yes, you can love the key lookups. You just don't want too many of them. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's like licorice ice cream, right? Small quantities is fine. Too much, not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, what a key lookup is, it's, it's like an index seek on mostly a clustered index. Can you do a key lookup on a non-clustered index? Probably not, right? I think I've tried, but never made, really succeeded. Anyway, for the purpose of this demo, let's just talk about clustered indexes. A key lookup is when you're looking for a specific clustered index key. Um, so let's look at if you select ID, first name, and birth date from ducks. 
no ordering, no anything, you can use a clustered index scan. This is a clustered index scan. So we take every row in the table from top to bottom and just return it the way it was. If we, oops, if we order by first name, something happens. SQL Server determines in, in its infinite wisdom that this problem is probably better solved using the index that we have on first name because we have the data sorted correctly. We won't have to resort the data. We can just use it in the order that it is stored in the first name index because it's already stored in the correct order. But this index does not contain the, the birth date co column. There is no birth date in the, in the um, non-clustered index because we didn't include it. That was the whole point. Sorry, that was the whole point of the non-clustered index. It, we're ordering it differently, but we're also using a narrower index. So it's fewer pages and faster to scan through. For this purpose, for every row in the index that we're returning, we need to look up a specific value, the birth date, for that record in the clustered index. So the key lookup, clustered in parentheses, so I assume there is a non-clustered, for every record in the index scan, that's what nested loop means, for every single record that comes this way, we're gonna do one point key lookup in the clustered index to look for the birth date, and then we return everything. This may still be a very good query because we don't have any ordering going on, so it's not memory hungry at all. It's with a small number of rows from the index, this may be a very, very quick query. And here it is. This is our clustered index. This is our non-clustered index. We're following the non-clustered index. And for Chuck here, number four, we do a key, a key lookup in the clustered index. Then we move to Daffy, which is number one. We do a key lookup for number one, and so on and so on. My infinitely amazing PowerPoint skills. Yes, because it was the next page. Oh. That's some next level shit. <laughs> the solution for this is to include birth date. We can simply make space. We can just add the birth date. Note the difference between an index column and an included column. The index column determines the sort order. So if you think of this, binary tree structure. It's actually, it's, it's divided and structured and ordered by the index key. The birth date is just a piece of information that we put at the leaf level. So if we look for Baba here, for instance, we will see that his birth date is also March 14, which is an ominous birth date. We won't have to do the key lookup. That way, we can just make an index scan on our non-clustered index. Obviously, adding included columns in non-clustered indexes makes them wider, makes them weigh in at more kilobytes, more pages, but instead you won't have to do any key lookups and you might even entice the SQL Server optimizer to choose that non-clustered index instead of just doing a clustered index scan. So this is, this is performance tuning 101. This is something everyone can do at some point and it's, it can give you an amazing speed boost for your queries. <clears throat> which brings me along to sorting. How are we on time? It's, we're halfway through. That's just about right. Say we want to select ID, first name, and roll from ducks, but we want to order it by ID. We can use the clustered index because it is ordered by ID. We can use its existing sort order. That is fine. What if we order by first name? If we order by first name, we still want columns that we don't have the role column in the non-clustered index that we created, remember? So we would have to do a key lookup. But if we have plenty of memory or if it's too many rows or otherwise inconvenient to do a trillion key lookups, which would take you until the sun grows cold, you can instead just do a clustered index scan and then sort it. Now, if 
if you think you have a like a deck of cards unordered unsorted it's been dealt it's been shuffled and you want to sort it can you do it while holding the deck of cards in one hand it's going to take you forever right how about two hands what if you have an entire table to lay it out if you can spread all those 52 cards on a table and then move them around it's a lot faster to sort them there's a catch you need a table and that table in our terms translates to space could be your memory or even worse it could be your temp db so basically we can't just if we get our rows our rows enter through the red tube on the left and we want them sorted out on the right so what we do is we collect them in our on our table or our temp db database before we can start processing because we can keep going all day the first duck might be the last one to arrive right so you can't start returning rows until you know which one is the first in the ordering which essentially means we need to collect all of our ducks here in our stash now we have all of them we sort them magic happens behind the cloud <clears throat> and we can start returning them one two three four five and so on you see how this this is working but did you notice here if i step back while we're filling up our temp db or memory or whatever with ducks nothing is moving on nothing is passing through the green tube if you think of this as data passing through your query plan and I realized this after I'd spent like eight hours designing my PowerPoint, all the rows are moving from left to right. And in the query plan, they're moving from right to left. You'll have to excuse me. If you think of all this time that it takes, if you have a million or a hundred million rows coming through the red tube here, while they're still arriving, while there are still more ducks coming out of that tube, you can't start returning rows. So you need to buffer them all and whoever, posted the query on the other, other end of the green tube is still waiting for their first result set to return. That's why we call this a blocking operation. So not only does it require memory grant, this is our memory, it also is a blocking operator because it holds the rows until it can start, re in, until a portion or all of the ducks have landed so we can start returning them. This is a key takeaway. There are some operations that are blocking and those may very well slow down your queries. How about window functions? Have you guys worked with window functions? Yeah, one. Have you worked with Windows functions? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to. Hello. So window functions are, in this example, we're just going to use a row number. So I want to declare a row number, an incrementing identity, ordered by first name and then ID as a tiebreaker. So the first name is Angus because he's first in the alphabet, gets number one, then number two, and then number three, Baba, number four, five, six, and Chuck, number seven, and so on. How would you do this if you think of them again as playing cards in your hand? You would take the first card, right? That's number one. Second card, number two. Third card, number three. Just keep going. With one catch. Those cards, those records, need to come in a sort, in a predictably sorted order. And what am I doing here? Yes. So this is essentially the same query under the uh, hood, performance-wise, or, or actually in the query plan. This is the same or an equivalent query as the other one. I've changed instead of order by first name and ID, which is here, I'm partitioning by first name and then ordering by ID. The difference is the row number resets every time the first name changes, but the sort order is still the same. Notice how the data that comes out is still the same. So here's how that works in our tube analogy. We collect ducks, they are ordered, so we have a sort operation somewhere in there that returns ducks in a, sort, in a sorted predictable order. We catch the first batch, we just fill the window, or actually we identify a window of ducks 
um, that starts the first, every, it, it resets every time the first name changes. So when A arrives, we start a new window. When B arrives, we start a new window and so on. So the first duck here, this is where the window changes. This is a new first name. So we set a little one and a zero and a zero and the B starts another one, sets a one, zero, zero. This is hidden from you. You don't see it in the data, but it happens under the, under the hood. And C again resets and so on and so on. So what happens here is this bit here is called the segment. So we identify a segment where here a segment starts, a new segment starts, a new segment starts. Then comes the sequence. This is number one. Every, every segment starts with a one. Then number two, number three, this is an easy increment. Then when the segment is one, the counter resets. Uh -huh. And you will notice that we're not buffering anything. Ducks come in, ducks go out. So every time a duck enters, or actually every time a duck leaves the red, it enters the green. It just passes through. We don't need any memory grant. We don't need any blocking operators or anything. We just pass them through. So, but the catch is they need to be ordered. We need them in an ordered data stream when we, when we get them. And SQL Server will provide for this by using either the sorted, the definition of the index, which is sorted by some kind of column set. In this case, we're using the non-clustered index, which is sorted on first name and then ID. So it's already done. This is the segment, generates a one or a zero, depending on if a new name appears, right? Then the sequence project, which actually does the number calculation, the one, two, three, four, five, oh, new, new name, one, two, three, four, and so on, so on, so on, and just return the data to the user. These two are best friends. They always or almost always appear together. So if you see one, chances are pretty good that you'll see the other one. Yes? But you can knock it off, uh, right? So in the red tube, if you would start a partition by on a column <coughs> that's not a non-clustered index, you would still have a heap, which you have uh, to order them and then send them out. So you would have like a heap before the input byte. Yes, yeah? yes, so I'll get to that. Yeah. I won't repeat the question because I'm going to come to that. Um, if the input source isn't already ordered correctly, what, we, what SQL Server does for you is in, introduce a sort operation. We saw the sort previously, and we, because here we're scanning the clustered index scan, the clustered index, which is sorted differently than we need, we're going to sort the data by first name and then, or birth date here and then ID, and then segment, and then sequence project, and then output. So again, if your window function runs slowly, look and you might find a sort operation, which is an easy fix if you just add an index. And uh, someone else will cover index hoarding, I'm sure, but you can add a billion indexes to your table and they will be fast to query and super slow to update. It's a topic for a different presentation. So the sort here is the blocking operator, which makes the lower query slower than the upper query. Stream aggregate is a form of aggregation that looks very much the same. Ducks come in, every duck carries a value, obviously. In this case, I'm simulating just a count star or something. So the first duck, we have a count star of one. The second, we have a count star of two, count star of three and we just keep going until we run out of ducks. Actually, sorry, um, we get a new partition here. Uh, so duck number B here starts over the counter. So if we're grouping by name and doing a count star, we get 15 ducks of type A and one, two, and so on on type B. Again, sorted input. The stream aggregate is conditioned upon that the input stream is already sorted. So we need the stream to be sorted. But there is an upside. There's a beautiful upside. There is no blocking. There is no temp DB spilling. This stream aggregate, like the name implies, just streams rows through. We're just aggregating rows in the 
in the order that they arrive, which is really, really nice for performance. If you can't get a stream aggregate and SQL Server won't sort the rows for you, it often will, but not always, SQL Server will fall back to the hash match aggregate, which is a handful to say. So hash match works in, it divides the rows into buckets, hash buckets. Uh, it makes a qualified guess that we have so and so many groups of rows. And then again, we need the memory grant somewhere to store them. So these are our hash buckets. We hash each key value, our aggregation key value into a hash. So this one, for instance, lands in this bucket. All the Bs land in this, this one, all the Cs land in this one. And we just keep going until we've got all, all of our ducks in hash buckets. So many ducks. Now that we've aggregated, we've bunched up all of our ducks into hash buckets, we can start actually returning rows, aggregating them and returning rows. So how many As did we get? How many Bs did we get, or Cs in this case, because hashing orders, and how many Bs. So you see, this is a blocking and a, this is a blocking operation and it requires a memory grant because we need somewhere to store this stuff in hash buckets. Preferably in RAM, if you're short on RAM, this stuff will end up in your temp DB at disk speeds, so you will be waiting for it. This is what a stream aggregate operation looks like. And the select distinct can also, is, it's also a type of, of stream aggregate really, uh, because it, except it just doesn't include an, an aggregate. It just bunches the rows together. But both of these queries can use the same stream aggregate operation. Um, if you're aggregating on values that aren't indexed or actually aren't sorted, you will end up with a hash match aggregate. aggregate except if SQL Server decides it's cheaper to sort it for you. So SQL Server, the optimizer, decides which is the better plan from judging from your query. And in this case, it decided that sorting will be faster, maybe because you're short on memory or I don't know. No, it's just how the data is organized and stream aggregate. So hash match aggregate is a blocking operator with, that requires memory grant. Sort is a blocking operation that requires a memory grant. So it's really choosing between the lesser of two evils. And there's a special mention to, if you do select distinct, you might end up with a sort distinct sort, which is, I don't see that too often, I think, but it's essentially, like a stream ag or a hash match aggregate, but it's a sort operation. It's a sort operation along with a stream aggregate. So I guess this could be simplified down to this. Question about the distinct sort. Yes. Uh, if I'm just thinking how I would implement it, I would think that it doesn't have to keep the data. It will Correct. An a, and then if the next one is an A, it will just discard. It so Correct. Have a lower memory grant. Yes. So in this example, uh, the sort operation will sort all of the rows and will just stream all of the, the arrows here. This arrow still contains every single row from our index scan. And then we stream aggregate it where we throw away the duplicates. But we're still passing all of those rows. These could be hundreds of millions of rows. The, Sort the distinct sort here will do these two in one fell swoop, which means we're not unnecessarily passing 100 million rows all over the place. But functionally, they're pretty much the same. I forgot to repeat the question, but that was the question. <laughs> Something about joins, and bear with me, we have 20 more minutes to go. Nested loop join is the most intuitive join to explain to people because it's, it's easy to understand how it works. And, and how many of you have programmed real programming languages like C-sharp or, yeah. So if you would want to join two record sets or join two streams from a CSV file or whatever it is programmers do, 
this is the way you would do it probably. You would take one row from the top input, right? And for that row, come on. You would match every matching row from the lower input, right? You would bunch them up and send them to the output. Next row from the top input, for every row, for that row, check every matching row in the lower input, bunch them up, send them to the output, and so on and so on. This is what it looks like. And every, every time you see a nested loop in a query plan, you can read it as, for every row in the top row, do this. So every row here generates one of these, which if you think about it, is a great idea if you have five rows here and 10 million rows here. That's a really efficient plan. If you have 10 million rows here and five rows there, you will be querying five rows 10 million times, which is much, much, much less efficient than querying 10 million rows five times. So beware of the nested loop. It has its very specific application, but you can read it as for every row in the top input, do this. It's literally a for next loop in a for next loop. Um, on the topic of this presentation, note that we're pulling these in the order of this index, right? We're pulling rows from this index. So that means we're preserving the order of this index. So if we're doing a clustered index scan on ducks, which is sorted by ID, the result set will still have be sorted by the ID. This is useful. This is, this is important to keep track of when you're performance tuning your queries. Go on. Tuning and order by would be free. Um, yes, if you want to order by ID, it's already done for you right here. Merge join, this is, this is probably my number one favorite operator. And again, if you're programming your own join routine, imagine if you have two data streams, what if they were sorted the same way? So here's the precondition. The top input is sorted and the bottom input is sorted and they are bo both sorted in the same order. This is important because what you can do is you can just zip, zip lock them into each other. Plix los principe. So A here matches A, B matches B, C matches C, and my clicker is not working for me very well. So you can see that we're not really allocating any memory. We don't need any storage space. We can just pass the rows through. And immediately when rows appear in the red, they go out in the green there's no waiting for anything you don't this is a very very efficient operation there is one catch if both of them are non-unique you need a small memory buffer to catch those cartesian products that's the catch so if if i were to say that merge join never requires a memory grant i would be technically lying this is the simplification part um, if you have non-unique values in both inputs, you will need a small memory grant for each Cartesian product. <clears throat> so I said it at least. This is the merge join. Again, we have a clustered index scan here and a clustered index scan here. Those are, as you can see here from the zip tie, sort of, they're, they're just blixlos principing each other. <laughs> that is the coolest English word ever. <laughs> and you will also see that we have, because they retain their order, the output will have the same ordering as the input. Also important. So in this case, it's a clustered index scan, which is ordered by ID, which means that the output will still be ordered by ID. remains the hash join. This is the third join, and this is what you will see most of all in your query plans, actually, because this is the heavy lifter. When nothing else works, this is what SQL Server will throw at the problem, um, pretty much. Like with hash aggregates, we have hash buckets, so we need the storage, and we're gonna use that storage to, to offload our rows while we 
build up our hash table. So here come the rows during what is known as the build phase. We dump our ducks into the buckets. Then we have the probe phase where we start collecting ducks from the other. Uh, I think technically this should probably be on top and this should be on the bottom, right? No one knows, so I'm right, probably. <laughs> yeah. And so for this one, we will see where does this match in the hash bucket? Oh, it matches hash bucket 94F8. And we will throw those into the output. And then we will get another one, match it to a hash value, and join them, and so on. Note that we require a memory grant, which can, be, oops, which can be substantial. We can use up a lot of memory like this, or obviously temp DB space. And the output needs to wait until we've finished the probe phase. We don't need to load everything from both inputs, but we will need to finish the probe phase before we can start outputting anything. So this is a blocking operation that requires a memory grant. Also, did you see what happens here? We're hashing the values. That means the output will be ordered by the hashing algorithm, not the input. So we're destroying our ordering here. Hash match changes the ordering of the data stream. If that's important to you, because say you're applying a window function or something afterwards, you might want to look for a different solution. As if you decide the uh, join operation. Hash match, you can see you, you can tape, the, these are our probe phases, and this is, this is the build phase, right? And this is the, the record that we're trying to match into one of the hash buckets. <clears throat> Parallelism. I can see you're sweating. <laughs> what happens if we have a single threaded throw, a single threaded flow? I will edit this out in the YouTube video. We go from start to finish, we keep our ordering. What if I have multiple processors? This is a lot of work. I want to split it between my processors. So I divide the work up. This is the non-parallel, this is the single threaded operation. If I split the work between multiple processors, some of the work goes on top, some of the work goes on bottom. This is pro processor one, this is processor two. Now, when I'm finished working, the rows aren't ordered correctly anymore. Actually, they're still ordered, but just not in the order that they came in. It's more or less random, and this has to do with how fast every single CPU thread finishes your work. So you can't really depend on the ordering once you've parallelized your operation and then uh, concatenated, what do you call it, gathered the streams. <clears throat> so, if ordering is important to you, even a single threaded plan might just be faster than say a two or four threaded plan because you'll eliminate the need for sorting and stuff like that. That may very well require a memory grant or disk space. Yes, question. Sorry? It could. I, I don't have the knowledge to deep dive into parallelism. I know that you can parallelize streams in a number of different ways. Um, I think the most common one of them is by a hash. Um, but when you gather the streams, if you want to do sort of like a merge uh, sort or a merge join eff effectively, that would, expo that would force you to wait for the slowest processor in effect. So if, if you have four processors and the uh, slowest processor um, is, is really, really slow, the other three is, would have to wait for that processor to return its thread of rows because you want to maintain the Blixdos principle. Uh, uh, cache. Yes, unless you cache them, which is a completely different animal. <laughs> Correct. You will notice that the uh, yellow markers here means parallelism, means the query is going parallel. And because we're scanning the clustered index in parallel here, and we're gathering the streams. So the select is obviously always single-threaded. 
I'm saying with some authority, hoping that I'm not wrong about this. The select is always single threaded because you only have one management studio here. So you want your, your result sets in one result pane. And so you will need to gather these streams here. And this is where that happens. <clears throat> Come on. This is the conclusion. This is why you've been trying to stay awake for the better part of 50 minutes. Why all of this is important? Why am I talking about ordering? Let's look at what I think is a fairly realistic query plan or parts of it. So from the top right, we do a clustered index scan on root schedule, which is a table. Now, this data stream is ordered by schedule ID. You don't, know, you don't need to keep track of this, but for this purpose, for the purpose of this demonstration, this stream here, you can imagine it with a pointer saying, this stream is ordered by schedule ID. So it starts with a low schedule ID and in, it increments. Now here, I want to group by this schedule ID for some purpose. So a stream aggregate is very suitable. What will the ordering of the output from a stream aggregate be? Any takers? Schedule ID. Schedule ID, right, because stream aggregate takes rows and outputs them in the same order. You can read your query plan like this. Now, for every schedule ID, for every row up here, remember nested loop, we want to do this, a clustered index seek on a table called months. Don't blame me, this is not my, it, it is my data model, but I was young and I needed the money. So the clustering key here is month, and so we're doing a clustered index key. So for every schedule ID, we're returning a bunch of rows sorted by month, right? How will this stream be ordered? Sorry? Schedule ID and, and month, right? So for every, so for schedule ID one, we get January, February, March. Schedule ID two, January, February, March, March and so on and so on. <clears throat> so now we have schedule ID and month. And for this, for every row here, we want to do a clustered index scan here, which is sorted by re report row. And you guessed it, we're just adding report row. So you can tell by reading the query plan how the rows are going to be sorted moving on. And that messes it up for SQL Service Optimizer. So for some reason, we need a different sorting order. And here we get a sort operation. The sort operation is by account ID and start date. Now for every combination of account ID and start date, we want to do an index seek and look for a specific account ID and a specific accounting date. So where our account ID is this and accounting date is this. And that usually does the trick. The cellular oh. charge of battery, right? <laughs> yeah, actually, I think so. They should use that on electric cars. You drive over a bump and it recharges the car. It's amazing. I'm going to patent that right after this session. Right, so for when we've selected these rows, we're grouped by account ID and accounting date, which remember is the key here for this index seek. So these rows are ordered by these columns which means we can apply a stream aggregate. So this is very, very efficient. No memory grant or anything. We do some compute scalar. I won't delve into that. Table spool means we're just, we're, this is a lazy spool, but essentially we're just caching some of the rows because we're going to repeat them many times over because this is a nested loop. We're going to be going back and forth here and getting more rows all of the time. So we're just caching them in the table spool. And because we, are, we have ordered the, this sort operation, ordered the data stream by account ID and then start date, now we've done a lookup on a specific account ID. And, oh, I sorry, it says accounting date greater than or equal to. So it, it returns a range of accounting dates. We've, we've added, added accounting date to the sort order after the nested loop. And this way it goes on and on and on and on. So if you see, in a query plan that you're trying to optimize and performance tune, 
that all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it just it won't merge join or it won't stream aggregate. It chooses some other operations like a, a hash join or a sort or or a, a hash match or something that you don't want. This is how you troubleshoot that. This is how you determine the sort order of the data. Think of all those arrows in a query plan as a sorted stream of data. That is the takeaway that I want to give you. And I hope that is my last slide. Yes, it was. <laughs> so make sure, uh, harass me on Twitter. Follow my blog, SQLSunday.com. I used to write more, but I'm trying really hard to catch up. Um, ask me anything. <laughs>